You asked me to talk about accuracy and the learning curve for spinal navigation. After 20 years of doing spinal surgery without navigation, in January 2011, I decided for me and my department that we start using spinal navigation. And we do basically every case we can with spinal navigation. We started with one unit, then we had a second unit, and now we're going to have a third unit. Um, the reason why I thought that's a good idea is because, A, it reduces radiation, uh, but someone else was talk about that, and um, it increases accuracy. And uh, at least in Germany, we say that better is the enemy of good. Um, how is this a balance? Yeah, yeah, pushing on the arrow. Now, these are my disclosures, and these three of them are relevant to that talk, obviously, uh, but there's no direct, direct correlation with it. Now, um, just to show you what kind of setup we have and what type of uh, things we use, um, the thing I will be talking about is what we use as a default, that is, um, I'm sorry, I'm we use an intraoperative imaging, that is 3D fluoroscopy, um, navigation for basically every case. That is our default procedure for every thoracal lumbar instrumentation that we do. The only instance we use preoperative imaging, that is CT navigation with regional matching, is for pedicle screws in the cervical spine or in the upper thoracic area. Reason for that is because it's highly mobile and a lot more accurate than if you use uh, intraoperative imaging. We have two systems. Um, one is um, the ISO C arm from Siemens, and uh, it is attached to a brain lip unit. And then we got an O arm, uh, uh, which is in itself attached to a stealth unit. Both have pros and cons. I'm not talking about that. Uh, but basically, they do the same thing. Uh, this is the setup um, that we have. And you can see that uh, the screen is on the right-hand side, usually. and the light emission is on the left-hand side where the scrub nurse is. Um, and this is one of the major issues why you have uh, problems with it because the line of sight problem, um, according to me, is what decreases accuracy and gives you wrong uh, um, positioning. We do use a navigated drill. Um, I, I mean, the, the drill guide, not the drill itself. And then in a way that you see. Uh, I like to have it done. One is holding the drill guide and the other one is drilling. And there's a reason for it. Um, if you do it all by yourself, then you usually turn around. Then the direction of the drill guide is different from it what it used to be. And then you have a line of sight problem because you reach into that, get the drill in your hands, and then you navigate with a picture which is 10 seconds old. Um, then we put a K-wire in and place the pedal screw over the K-wire. That's the default procedure that we do for a thoracal lumbar. And then we have a final control. So how long did it take for my department to get there? Um, we analyzed the first year, uh, or you, me, did. Um, we divided it into four quarters. And you can see on that slide, quarter one to quarter two, um, that these are the times it took. So it was decreasing over that time frame. Uh, I will show you the figures, and you can read them because they are in the spine journal. Um, in the end, after one year, we were back to normal. Okay, we have eight surgeons, three fellows, and 15 residents, and a variable number of scrub nurses walking around. We got one usually guy who's taking care of the navigation, but he's not there all the time. So this is at least in a huge center what it takes. Um, in the same time, accuracy increases. And in figures, it says that on the average, when we started for the first year, it took us 15 minutes to do the first 3D scan. Uh, the final scan was a little bit faster, and time per screw was five minutes. By the end of the year, if divided into four quarters, um, we had half the time for everything. And that then was equivalent to doing it with freehand 2D fluoro. Accuracy increased, and I will talk about that soon. Um, obviously, that is dependent where you work. As I just said, if you're working in a unit with four surgeons, always the same staff people, and um, you have the same nurse and the same technician doing that, it might be faster. 
Um, but in a unit like that, this is how it, what it takes. Um, and the number one thing is don't use it in selected cases. Use it all the time, but if you, if you don't do it, you never get integrated into your workflow. You're never going to reach that type of being confident with it because you have to be confident with the navigation. You have to know, well, don't rely on it in a blind fashion. You have to see that, no, that can't be right. So you change it, etc., etc. You only get there if you use it all the time. If you use it in the difficult cases, don't use it at all. Because this is the type of argument that you will hear from surgeons that use in a difficult case, it didn't work, it took a long time, blah, blah, blah. The only way to get around this is use it in every case that you can. Now the accuracy data for the first year. These are the screws that were set. We only had one unit at that time in one OR, 260 cases in that OR um, with that type of screws. And um, so we had a navigation accuracy at the end of 98%. There was a big difference between thoracic and lumbar spine. Even if you analyze the data for the learning curve, that was the biggest issue, getting down from the thoracic spine to um, uh, getting up from a low number in the thoracic spine to a number in the high 90s. Um, screw revisions in that time. Um, Intraoperative screw revisions well, you, you obviously you are quite liberal. If you see a screw that you don't like, you just revise it and then uh, do it. Um, but nothing's perfect. Um, we had five patients in the thoracic group and two in the lumbar group that had to be revised in a second surgery. That was due to the fact that they were either very obese. So it's usually it's image quality. Um, so you're not quite sure what you see. Um, and you think it's okay, but in the post-op CT that you do, because you weren't quite sure, you see that it's not okay. And on two instances, the system break, uh, broke down, so we didn't actually could blame that on the system. Um, we were interested in the number of revision surgery that we had to do if they are really going down. So we did a match pair analysis, a retrospective uh, manner in uh, looking at the first three and a half years we did with 3D fluoro. That was group one, and then the freehand, that is a 2D fluoro um, from April 2007 to December 2016. Um, these were, in each group, roughly 1,100 procedures um, uh, with about 7,000 pedicle screws, and uh, there was not a big difference in the patient population between two groups. Um, and you see that there was a reduction in revision surgeries. In the freehand group, you saw 4.3% or 4.4% of patients needed a, re a revision. And keeping in mind that you usually, if you see a screw that is acceptable, you won't take the patient back to the OR. Uh, versus 1% in uh, the 3D fluoro group. That means in total numbers, we reduce it from 50 to around 15 revision surgeries. Okay. Cervical, I uh, just want to touch this. Um, if you put a patient uh, in a Mayfield and then have him on a table, then the, and, and you like to do pedicle screws, cervical pedicle screws. The, 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 according to me, um, you can't use 3D fluoroscopy because it's highly mobile. And you need an, an extremely good accuracy if you, if you place a pedicle screw in a, a subaxial cervical spine. Plus, cervical thoracic junction, the image quality, the pre-op image quality on the 3D floor is very bad. So um, we switched to regional matching there and did a prospective uh, study if that's good. Uh, 194 pedicle screws in 41 patients were seen in a, a short time frame of about 10, 11 months. Um, they were graded like that. So Grade C and D will be unacceptable. Grades A, which is perfect, and grade B, which is good, but not perfect. Uh, and this is the result that you get that um, A and B covers basically 95% of your pedicle screws in the subaxial cervical spine and in the upper thoracic spine. So this is our default procedure for that. What would I, if I could wish, have different? Number one, I would have, uh, I would like to have uh, a better image quality um, with a small device. You can have a CT, um, then you have a very good image quality, but uh, that's a true CT then. 
uh, which disrupts a little bit your workflow more than having a, a 3D Fluoro device. Uh, one of the number one things I would like to see is that you don't have any more line of sight problems because according to me, this is at least in my department, the number one uh, problem in doing uh, inaccurate screw placement. Um, anything else? Well, in, in extending your indications, uh, new technology has to be advanced. That's about it. Thank you.